So I'm here to, to tell a story, a story about uh, how we use, utilize Kafka and Kafka Streams in our company to solve interesting problems and interesting use cases. Uh, but I think it's useful because this is uh, the first time I'm at Berlin Buzzwords whatsoever. Um, so it's interesting for me to know who's the audience. So I have some categories here. I was hoping people could raise their hands when they feel they belong to that category. I use Kafka, but I need to know if Kafka Streams is something for me. Okay, cool. I think you're in the right, uh, in the right room. I use other streaming frameworks like Flink, Spark Streaming, or Samsa, but I'm not particularly familiar with Kafka Streams. Some? Cool. I use Kafka Streams, and I'm just here to learn how you guys did it. Nice. I, I'm really hoping to meet you guys after the presentation, too. So come, come see me. We have a lot to discuss. Who's new, new to Kafka? OK. I have something for you guys, too. Uh, so today, I'm, I'm going to to tell you a story. I need to provide some context to you because I think it matters uh, because we, you need to understand the scope of the problem we're solving. And I'm going to give a brief introduction to the technologies we're using, which is Kafka and Kafka Streams. And then we're going to build an application here on the slide deck. Uh, take one line of code at a time. And I, I promise you, I, I will present 100% of the lines of code that interacts with the Kafka Streams API. Uh, that actually solved this, solved this problem. And then we're going to talk a little about how to put our app into production, how we, uh, how we put the app into production, and how like, so, sort of the, uh, the choices we had to make and the problems we ran into. And then we'll have a really short slide about uh, the conclusions and what we've learned uh, during this presentation. Um, so my name is Håkon Omdal. Uh, I'm a data engineer in uh, Shipstead. I'm sorry I don't want work for Confluent, even though I have this amazing Kafka t-shirt. Um, and this is, as I told you, this is the first time at Berlin Best Words, and I'm, I'm particularly fond of stream processing, and you probably noticed that during this presentation. It's a little hard talking about Shipstead in Germany. Uh, Shipstead isn't a very strong brand in itself, but it has a lot of local brands. And I've noticed there are a lot of people from France here, and we do own Le Bon Coin. So Shipstead owns a lot of uh, media sites. They're particularly big in, uh, in Norway and Sweden. And we do also own these marketplaces for classified ads in Sweden. Uh, Norway, France, Italy, Spain, and so on. Uh, and we also have some other uh, growth concepts. And all of these sites, uh, they implement the Sh Shipstead custom tracker. Uh, we have a tracker for iOS, for Android, and for the web trackers. Uh, and these uh, trackers, they generate sort of this clickstream data where like, you, they send uh, a signal every time you click a link or view an item on these sites to a data collection service which we, where all the events end up in an AWS Kinesis stream. Here we split the stream into two different pipelines. We have a more traditional uh, batch processing pipeline where we run uh, batch jobs, mostly Spark, some other stuff as well, where we use uh, AWS S3 as sort of the backing store for this. And the other one is the streaming pipeline. It comes with uh, some different delivery guarantees. It's much more timely than the batch pipeline, of course. Uh, and, um, and this is where sort of, this is Kafka-based streaming platform, uh, which I'm going to sort of talk about today. And we do, I mean, I've seen uh, like um, some sponsors here, they brag about like half a trillion events each day. We are not at that scale, but we're fairly large. We collect somewhere between 700 and 800 million events each day, and that's on average. So uh, at peak hours, it's around 2 million events during the evenings in, uh, 2 million events each minute, and that's during the evenings in, uh, in Europe. And even though, but this number is large enough that we're talking about, uh, we need a solution that scales. Uh, we cannot run this on a single thread, on a single machine. We need a distributed system to solve problems in this scope. Um, we use the streaming platform for a lot of things in Shipstead, and I could talk on and on 
of all, about all the cool things we do. We, uh, but to scope this uh, talk, we're going to talk about targeted advertising in Shipstead. Because uh, what we do is the end user will enter a page and will get signals from that user entering that page. Uh, we use our streaming platform to do some, um, some transforms, some filtering, and sort of forward that data to a user segmentation engine, where a user, based on its behavior, is sort of pr gets its gender and age, and we have some other models running as well, get that predicted, and that will in turn um, result in targeted ads for that user. Uh, so it's really important that this happens fast. Ideally, we want the user to enter the front page, say, of a news page, and by the time he clicked the article, there, there will be a relevant ad uh, displayed to him uh, the, at the very next page view. And, and needless to say, this is, this is big business. This is really, really big business. So whatever downtime we have, whatever data quality issues we have, whatever completeness issues we have, uh, will affect the total revenue of Shipstead. Okay, so the business guys, um, and I mean, it's pretty obvious that um, if you want to sell stuff, location is a very good thing to know about the user because then you can have some location-based uh, targeted advertising. Um, so um, a team in Shipstead, that's not my team, uh, but uh, this is used throughout Shipstead for several services. We have this location API where you can, uh, it's an HTTP service, where you can um, add an IP address or even IP address and coordinates as input, and get then get like the coordinates and uh, the reverse geocode components like zip code and country in return. And uh, I talked with someone yesterday. I think he's here in the room. He said, "Why don't you just keep all of this in memory?" And the short answer is, then it wouldn't be as interesting standing here and talking to me today because part of the complexity comes from this API. Um, uh, the long answer is um, there are some some logic there. We do run our own models. We do need to look up a reverse geocoding service uh, that makes it, s and we use it throughout Shipstead. So that makes it uh, like it made, and that is why it's sort of behind an HTTP API. So um, the idea here uh, is to sort of make something. That something being the the question mark, uh, the blue box with the question mark, within our streaming platform. And I mean, we could put everything into the user segmentation engine, but then we would only have this data for only user segmentation. If we sort of move it into sort of the central streaming platform of uh, Shipstead, then all of the, um, the users of the streaming platform would have the benefit of extra enrichments in their events. Um, and this is sort of what we're going to, to dive into today. Um, there are some requirements, um, contradictory requirements even. Uh, I mean, latency is paramount here. We, the events need to, uh, to come in a timely fashion because that will affect the performance of the targeted ads. Uh, and it's sort of a very crucial part of the event too, like to have this piece of location information. And uh, these are contradictory because you can't really have both if the API go down, but the essence here is you need a button. You can tune the trade-off between the two of them. Uh, as I to told you guys earlier, we have a substantial amount of events. I said not a lot, but still um, a, roughly a billion events each day is something we need, uh, system, we need our system to handle that. Perhaps more importantly, uh, we're in the news business, and breaking news do happen. Uh, this is from a Norwegian, uh, uh, Norwegian site, and you can see the traffic increases by five times during a uh, period of two minutes, and then that, that's when a push notification goes out for a particular breaking news event. And it's the location API itself, because it doesn't scale to look up one event at a time. You need to bulk the incoming events and look them up um, together. Uh, you, it does, uh, it's rate limited, so we need to apply some back pressure uh, on the client. And uh, it can be slow, and it, it can fail. OK, so let's talk about Kafka. Kafka is based on uh, a very simple 
uh, I'd say. A very simple data structure called a log. Uh, I'm not sure the exact definition of a log, uh, but it, it's something where writers append to. Uh, uh, you can have multiple writers, and then you can have a set of consumers consuming this log in sort of whatever speed they want, and they normally start from the beginning and process the, the events. Um, Kafka offers something uh, very similar to a log, or I mean, it's, it's still a log, but they call it, it's a logical name called the topic, where each uh, topic is a set of independent partitions, um, where uh, sort of the semantics are that uh, writes within, uh, writes and reads within the partition is ordered, but in between the partitions, uh, there are no particular ordering. You cannot guarantee ordering. Um, and the reason why you split it up in partitions is, uh, is because that's how you make this technology scale, because it's, it doesn't work to only have one single log for, uh, for a system that produces uh, one billion events each day. Um, a log entry in Kafka consists of three items. You have a key that can be pretty much anything you want, uh, as, uh, or any bytes you want, I mean. It's a uh, it contains a value, which also uh, has the same um, possibility to, to contain whatever byte sequence you want. And then there's a timestamp. And I'll come back to all of these three later in the presentation. Uh, so Kafka provides these uh, topics, uh, these sort of distributed logs, um, at scale. Uh, uh, and they offer replication for these topics as well. And, and you normally run this as a, in, a, in a Kafka cluster, or I mean, you have to have a Kafka cluster to run Kafka, I mean. Uh, and there are a set of applications that uh, sort of uses this uh, Kafka cluster. You have uh, producers that will sort of produce and write data to the topics, you have consumers that will consume data, maybe build up some internal state or do some processing. Uh, there's a separate class uh, of um, of applications that uh, that you can call connectors, where you can sort of connect the change log from your database uh, or the other way around to keep Kafka and your database in sync. And then you have this stream processor apps, which I reads and writes to the Kafka cluster uh, in, in the same operations, and uh, and they can have more cool stuff like joins, aggregates, group buys, and that kind of thing. And this is where you find Kafka streams. Um, although, so the topic is, uh, the topic and the way they're distributed, the way they scale, is sort of the, the main thing uh, about Kafka. That, that's sort of the, the brilliance of it. But there's one, one other concept that, at least in my opinion, is equally important, and that's the um, that's the abstraction of a Kafka consumer group. Because in our case, on the slide here, um, we have a consumer, Kafka consumer, that consumes from 12 partitions. And they, they sort of, and you have, if you have three, th three threads, they even out. So they uh, process four partitions each. However, it could be like this event, uh, this breaking news, like the event volume increases, and you're going to need more power to process this. And you can actually just start another consumer thread. Uh, and that doesn't even need to be on the same machine. That can be in an entirely different machine, entirely different uh, container or anything. And Kafka will, behind the scenes, uh, redistribute the load. So, and this way, you can scale your application as long as you have enough partitions. OK, so let's, um, that's sort of the, the context, the, the technol, um, like the, the business case. And we talked a little about like, the technology we're going to use uh, to solve this problem. So let's start developing the actual application that will do this, uh, these lookups for us. And uh, as you guessed, we're using Kafka Streams to do that. So uh, very, very simplified. Uh, the original setup uh, looks like this. We have the firehose containing all of the events uh, that we ingest into the pipeline. And we have a filter and transform component that will uh, filter the events and only forward those that are relevant to the advertisement uh, team and the segmentation engine. Uh, yeah. And this app also 
Uh, it's not shown here on the slide. It probably should. This sort of is the main workhorse of the, the streaming data platform. So this this filter and transform component does a lot of the work uh, in the data platform, and it writes to several topics and have many many use cases. So we kind of want to leave that component alone. Um, so uh, I mean, but that's the brilliant about brilliance about Kafka. Uh, you can have multiple consumers consuming from the same topic. So it felt safe to create something new, uh, something that didn't affect uh, the already running system. I mean, that affects advertising, but a lot of other uh, teams as well. And we wanted it to look up the API and, and create a known, a known um, topic with the location data. So to set up a Kafka Streams application, you need two com uh, config parameters. You need to set the application uh, name or application ID. And you also need to specify the address of uh, one of the Kafka brokers in your cluster. Then you um, create this uh, KStream Builder class. And this is where you create the actual application, the actual topology. And I have multiple slides on that later. But once your topology is ready, you create the Kafka Streams uh, instance, and you start it. And then you, it's a good practice to add a shutdown hook as well, so you, you can uh, handle uh, uh, shutdowns gracefully. And that's it. And this is, uh, it doesn't require any, except for, of course, having your Kafka brokers up. This is a standalone JVM application. You don't need any particular infrastructure. You don't need uh, Yarn or anything to run this. It's just a library. And that's sort of one of the things I really like about Kafka, uh, Kafka, Kafka Streams. OK, so let's do the first attempt to read the firehose. Uh, we set up um, a case stream uh, where, we, where we specify the name of the topic, and we specified, specify something called a CERD. A CERD is short for um, serializer, deserializer, or something like that. And, and that sort of is, the, um, uh, is how Kafka knows how to, to sort of translate the bytes on the topics into uh, Java objects and vice versa. Um, so uh, Kafka Streams comes with a built-in cert for strings, but uh, it doesn't come with any JSON support. And we use JSON in Shipstead. I'm sorry. Um, so we have to create our own custom uh, JSON cert to solve this problem. And doing so is fairly straightforward. Um, you implement an interface where you need to override um, yeah, in short, you need to override the deserialize and serialize methods. In our case, we use Jackson to, to perform this for us. Um, and yeah, that's it. We, the, we specify the code how to go from, from bytes to JSON nodes and from JSON nodes to bytes. So this is how it looks like now. Uh, and I can tell you already, this doesn't really work. Uh, I don't expect you guys to, to read the entire slide here. There are some hints of what happened. It's some um, fail to deserialize, JSON parse exception, pending shutdown, dead. Um, so it turns out I had, this was my local development environment, I had some garbage in my topic uh, that didn't uh, really uh, parse as JSON. And you guys might think, well, but in production, don't you always have JSON? Yeah, sort of. But I mean, you do get garbage in your pipelines, and we need to be able to handle that. Uh, so what we need to do is sort of take back control. So we want uh, to handle the parsing ourselves within the, uh, within the topology. Um, so we, instead of using this JSON, uh, JSON node cert, we use a byte cert. Um, and then we map the values ourselves. Uh, but this time we wrap it in a try. Uh, I mean, we do a try catch operation the Scala functional way. Um, and we only include those values that actually parses. Uh, so we add a filter, and then we, we sort of get uh, the results of the successful uh, parse parsers. And uh, so here I introduced uh, the, the map values, which you can call on the stream, and there's also a filter. But uh, what they say is when there's a filter and there's a map, there's also a flat map. And luckily, Kafka Streams provides that to us. So we made that a little simpler. Um, 
So now we have a stream of um, string keys and JSON node uh, values we need to, uh, to work with. Uh, we need to turn these, uh, these JSON nodes into request objects uh, that looks like this. Um, I told you I was going to show you all the lines of the code. I'm not going to show you this. It doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a JSON node to request uh, function that will sort of extract the relevant values. Um, so we'll map all of these, uh, these JSON nodes into, um, into request objects using map values. And now I'm going to introduce to you a new function on the KStream class, which is called peak, because I'm interested in, in how many of these events we can use. So peak is a very nice function to handle side effects that lets you inspect each and every, like inspect, like look at every single element with ac without actually uh, modifying them. Uh, so this is perfect to, to increase uh, metrics, for instance, to, to measure the performance and the quality of uh, the pipeline. And then for all of the um, request objects that actually has a value, we do a flat map and we end up with the stream of uh, requests. Okay, let's produce the output. So based on the stream with um, requests, we hand it over to a uh, transformer, a location API transformer. Um, and we're also curious about um, how this transformer performs. Like, we need to see how many coordinates were successfully looked up and how many, um, like, we didn't find. And when we're done, we have a similar inverse function where we map from, uh, from response objects into JSON. And then we put it back on the Kafka cluster to the location data topic. And now you guys are, hold on, hold on, what's happening here? What is this? Um, do you remember that I told you um, we cannot look up one single event at a time? We need to do some bulking of requests? Well, so it turns out um, in order to do bulking, we cannot easily use the, the sort of functionality that the Kafka Streams DSL provides. Because Kafka Streams DSL, which I've showed you so far, uh, looks very much like how you'd write Spark code, how you'd write uh, functional programming, and so on. But in order to do the bulking and work on multiple events, uh, items at a time, we need to use um, something called the Kafka Streams processor API. And the, the processor API is quite large uh, in itself, but one of the uh, interfaces in this processor I API is something called the transformer. A transformer has four functions. It has an initialize and a close function. And then it has two methods. Uh, one uh, is called um, transform. And that one is called every time on each single event uh, in the stream. And the second one is called punctuate, which is um, a method that is called periodically. And th this is what we're going to use to actually trigger uh, requests to the, the API. Um, so to set it up, uh, we store the processor context that um, that comes into to through the init function. We also schedule punctuate to be called, like we just had to pick a number. So we, we picked uh, 500 milliseconds. So now uh, punctuate will be called every 500 milliseconds. And uh, there are also two more things here in the slide. There are, there's a buffer which is where we'll keep our events until we look them up. And there's a, a location API client, which is, I mean, it's, it's out of scope to show you how that works. It's uh, an HTTP client where we can, it, that inputs request objects and returns response objects. The transform function is super simple because every time we see a new event in the stream, uh, we want to add it to the buffer and nothing more. We could have returned a value here, but we don't want to, so that's why we return null. We, the only thing we do is we add this tuple to the buffer. The fun part is, um, is the punctuate me method, because here, um, this is Scala, by the way, I guess most of you guys already figured that out. Um, uh, we uh, take all the requests in the buffer, um, and we group them in sort of the size that is optimal for the API, which in, in our case is 250 and we do this bulk lookup operation. 
And then we do some, um, then we s sort of look up all the requests, we await the results, and then we look up the corresponding keys uh, for, for all the requests we have stored, and then we call context forward with our response. And that way we're emitting uh, data down to like the downstream uh, elements. Uh, however, unfortunately, um, our API only returns successful lookups, so we need to sort of iterate over uh, all the keys we didn't find and where we emit like these non-values uh, uh, because th those are equally important too. We don't want to, uh, we want to forward as many events uh, from this transformer as we got in. Uh, after, we do, after we have sort of committed, uh, sorry, after we forwarded all the events we are supposed to forward, then we commit everything and we clear the buffer and we return uh, nothing uh, because we've already ret returned um, what we wanted to return. And I mean, this it doesn't really matter what's on the slide here except for what I've uh, uh, sort of marked here. And that is you have the possibility to forward uh, an arbitrary amount of events in this uh, um, in this, using this process for API, and that's uh, and that is how we solve our problem. Okay, so small recap: this is actually, except for the, the more advanced transformer, this is how our application looks like. And honestly, I think it's quite easy to to reason about that this sort of looks right, and this is uh, like the development time of such application isn't that long. Uh, there's one more problem though, and. We haven't joined the streams. Like it's location data without anything else is useless. So uh, let's join. Kafka Stream supports joins. Um, what we do is we create uh, two streams, one for location data and one for this relevant user data. Uh, we call the join operation on the stream and then we specify the stream we want to join with. And this is an inner join. That means you need events from both streams in order to uh, to join them. And then you specify uh, the function. The, like the join function. In our case, we just mutate the JSON object. We set the location uh, in the user data object and, um, and inject the location event. Uh, then we specify a join window. I have a slide on that coming uh, right next after this, so I'll explain it then. And then actually we need to specify the thirds for this join. And the reason that the first one is uh, the, the third for the key, and the second, the two after that, is the third for the two values in the, the stream. And the reason why we need to do that is because join is a um, stateful operation. Uh, so it's actually materialized uh, the join in a changelog topic uh, behind the scenes. So it needs to be able to serialize and deserialize these values. And then we forward it to this user data with location uh, topic. About join windows, is, I'm not sure if you remember from earlier presentation, I said uh, each Kafka entry has a key, a value, and a timestamp. So far, we've only focused on the value. Now it's time to, f like, but the join uses the key and the timestamp. Because, uh, of course, two keys, uh, we leave our keys unchanged uh, during this processing. We've never touched them, so and the keys will be the same uh, for the for both the, the, like the relevant user data uh, event and also the corresponding location data event. However, for uh, something to qualify for a join, the key obviously needs to be the same, but you also need to be within a specific time window. So that means uh, the location event needs to sort of arrive within 10 seconds, either 10 seconds before, which is impossible in our case. Uh, no, it's not, by the way. Uh, or 10 seconds after, uh, it needs to come in between that window, else it doesn't really qualify for the join. Um, and the reason why we picked this window is like if we don't see this event after 10 seconds, it's no longer usable for advertising purposes. Um, we have some, um, okay, so we've now let's put everything into sort of deploy it, put it into production, and I'll tell you guys what works and what doesn't work, uh, uh, at least in our experience. Um, so first, we put this thing into production, and I, I can't say nothing more that this really worked. And it worked quite well, I'd say. Um, this is the latency measurements uh, with the 500 millisecond punctuate uh, punctuation interval, we had the latency between 400 and 500 milliseconds extra on each event for this. Turns out IP addresses 
tend to be you tend to see a lot of the same IP addresses and like the location API will always return not always but for the course of 24 hours it will no normally return the same values for a specific IP address so we implemented an in-memory cache uh, using Guava and that sort of reduced the latency uh, to 80 milliseconds perhaps and then we reduced um, the punctuation interval uh, to 100 milliseconds and now we're down to to somewhere between 30 and 40 milliseconds uh, latency. And that, that's additional uh, to what they, I mean, uh, this, is, this is the time it takes for the, the app I showed you from when it sees an event, like it picks it up from the stream until it writes it back to the stream. And I said, this is, this is absolutely good. Uh, this is a very decent result. Uh, we needed to implement the join code I showed you uh, as well, and uh, sort of this was a very simple piece of code. So, well, why not use this workhorse of ours to to do the join there? Great idea. Um, this is the event. This is a graph showing the event volume that we uh, work with, like um, that is being processed at the time. We deployed the join and like the event volume. Yeah, it dropped dramatically. And this is very interesting. And this is something you should be aware of too when you develop Kafka Streams application. Because what happened is like we, we, we do this uh, red black style deployment where we have an uh, old cluster and then we deploy a new cluster. Uh, I mean, they have more threads than three each, of course. Um, okay, so when we deploy a new, uh, new cluster, uh, the Kafka consumer group or like the behind the scenes uh, will try to distribute this is the fire hose that is represented with these green arrows to the new cluster and I mean this is everyone is happy about this however the new cluster will also start processing the new input topic uh, which is contains the location data um, and so far so good uh, what happens now is the new cluster sees, oh, there's this consumer group. It doesn't really consume this new uh, location data topic. So it tries to hand it over to the old cluster. And the old cluster, it doesn't have any code even. So this thing, yeah, it goes down. And you think we should be fine uh, by sort of hardly, like, I mean, removing this uh, old cluster. Uh, completely and sort of now only the new cluster is here, but this is super unhappy too about not being able to, uh, that the other cluster died, so now we have nothing. And this is sort of what happened. So we did a new attempt. We s This time we had a control, we scaled down our entire old cluster first and we scaled up the new one, and that worked for 10 minutes. And um, yeah, we gave up after that. We're not touching that app anymore with uh, any more joins. Uh, I'll come back to that later. Mm. But we did see a very interesting fault, which I haven't seen in a while. It was a segmentation fault. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's not really what you the actual error is. But uh, we were uh, maybe we were lucky. Maybe we did some good work figuring out what happened. But it's the, the problem was with the join window because even though we have specified a join window of 10 seconds, that doesn't, the join is still has a retention time of 24 hours. So that means every time it sees an event, it needs to browse all those, perhaps they, ha they of course have a more, much more, uh, a much better data structure than a linear search, but still it will have to keep all of those 800 million events in, in, in the join window uh, or in the join. So you can actually specify to reduce the, the join window substantially. I set it to, uh, we set it to 30 seconds. So that means after 30 seconds, like whatever, uh, whatever's in your join is lost. And I mean, this is fine for our case. Um, and yeah, we learned something new also. Uh, we're not touching this filter and transform uh, application anymore because our team started getting really bad reputation for not providing uh, a sufficiently good service. So we implemented a new uh, in, it, in a new application, and um, yeah, it, it worked. Uh, performance, um, I mean, I used to be a little happy about this performance. Uh, I'm no longer happy about this performance because um, in the, what this slide shows is that like the actual uh, latency of lo doing the HTTP lookups, it's, it's very small compared to the overhead of doing the joins and so on. 
Uh, and uh, it turned out this uh, solution, like we wanted uh, a solution that could handle errors in the location API or in the, the like the uh, errors in the location transformer itself by like splitting it up, having one app for joins, one app for location transformer, but we didn't get any of these flexibility at all. Because I mean, if this crashes, then I mean, this could crash, I mean, this could crash separately. Uh, this uh, location data topic will go dry, there will be no events, and since we specified uh, inner join, this thing goes dry too. So, so we've sort of gained nothing about having three applications here. Uh, another thing is uh, related to cost. Uh, I'm trying to, to f uh, show you guys uh, some proportions when it comes to the cluster size, because it doesn't matter how many squares are within each application, but uh, the important thing here is proportions. So the main workhorse in our streaming application, the filter and transform, uh, the Kafka Streams application, would normally run with about eight nodes. Uh, and the much, much simpler location API component would have somewhere between three and five nodes on average four. However, this thing would have 15, and not, now I'm being nice. I saw 20 and 22 at some points too. Like keeping this join uh, and running this is, is um, I'd say, uh, expensive. So yeah, we, we ran this for a while and it worked, but yeah, we fixed it. We actually dropped doing the join whatsoever. So we would uh, use the location transformer to create uh, relevant user data with location topic directly from uh, this location transformer. And that turned out, turned out to be uh, uh, much more cost efficient and much more, uh, had much, much lower latency as uh, I showed you on the previous slide. And to tune this trade-off between completeness and latency, we have a custom circuit breaker here, rather than trying to tune it at the join. So um, I think concluding uh, this uh, presentation is, um, we can do that in four simple bullets. I say that um, Kafka Streams offers sort of this straightforward application development because it's just an app that runs on your computer. Uh, and as long as you only use the Kafka Stream DSL, it feels very familiar if you're sort of used to other frameworks like Spark or if you're used to functional programming. I think it scales pretty well for the basic stuff. It, uh, I mean, we have, do get up to 2 million events each minute, and these applications handle it no problem. Um, you should perhaps, that at least this is uh, something we've learned not only from doing this project, but similar project, is that the Kafka way of doing things is to have many smaller applications. So if you want to go uh, all in on Kafka Streams, you should probably make sure you keep the, uh, the cost of deploying new applications, running new uh, applications. Uh, you should keep that cost as low as possible. Uh, and in general, I'd encourage some, uh, my, uh, yeah, to be a little careful when it comes to these stateful operations because they work. We've proven that they work, but uh, they can be uh, very expensive and uh, might not give the flexibility that uh, that you think they may. So by that, I conclude my presentation and open up for questions. Hey, thanks hey. for uh, showing your learnings. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When you think about the the uh, nodes and the number, the application size, mm -hmm. that is not uh, that is the actual uh, code process in the in the streams, not the Kafka cluster. That's the code uh, <coughs> processing the stream. The Kafka cluster is something different. Uh, the, does Kafka streams have any impact on the Kafka cluster? Uh, sometimes it does, because it can start writing a lot of intermediate topics, and those intermediate topics might not have the replication factor that we wanted, so that can stall some of the applications if uh, a broker goes offline. 
Cool, thanks. Um, I saw that you use Firehose and Kafka. Firehose is the AWS Firehose. Oh, uh, no. Uh, Firehose is sort of my name for a topic that contains everything. Okay. Cool. And, and the name of that topic is Firehose. Uh, cool, thanks. Other questions? Thanks for a great presentation. Thank you. You said that you had some problems with the joins, and I noticed that was between two streams. Yep. And then you folded for that solution and tried something else. Do you do you still use joins between streams and streams, or streams and tables anywhere no. else? No, uh, we don't. And um, yeah, no, we we don't. And I tried actually using global K tables for the cache like to store the results for the lookups. That didn't work at all. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah, wh why did you conclude that you need smaller deployments instead of multiple topologies in the same? Um, because of the issue with this, you know, you saw crash and fire on my slides? This thing? Yeah. I mean, for this, uh, like, these applications we run in our streaming platform, uh, there we don't want any downtime on this. And uh, in order to add mul like multiple topologies to an application, you actually need to do a full scale down before you scale up again. Okay. And that's the reason why we chose uh, like that. Thank you. And and we also have a setup in ships that we're deploying applications is is fairly straightforward. So that means it doesn't really add much cost, but it adds benefits, uh, only the benefits. So last question. Uh, in this uh, last uh, image with the architecture with the circuit breaker, um just need to burn some clusters first let me see uh this yes one. exactly so if um if the location api fails is the message still forwarded yes so okay. it, like it's very easy for us to tune that circuit breaker because we we can always like for every event we start start trying to look up and then we just time out and forward the original event so uh, I wanted to use the join to tune this parameter, but I couldn't get it to work because uh, the only applicable join was, uh, uh, was the inner join. Um, if you meet me later, I can tell you why a left uh, join doesn't work. Uh, so by sort of moving that responsibility into the transformer, uh, we had a very easy opportunity to, to choose how long we would wait for the location API to respond. Does, does that answer your question? Thank you.